I am Megan Hennis. I'm the Visitor Services Coordinator here at the museum. And thank you for joining us today. We're, today we're gonna be talking about bison babies. So without further ado, I'll turn things over to Alana to get started. Thank you, Megan, and welcome everyone to Bison After Breakfast. We are glad to have you all here. I'm Alana Zenos, Executive Director for the National Buffalo Museum. The museum is a nonprofit founded in 1991, and our mission is to advocate for the restoration of the North American bison through education and outreach. Due to COVID-19, the museum is temporarily closed to the public, but we're thrilled to be able to connect with you all here. Closure has meant that our revenue is minimal right now. So if you're able to support us financially through a donation or through shopping on our online store, which has a bunch of cool stuff, please do so. We would really appreciate it. Um, there will be chats or there will be links in the chat box for where you can find these things. Um, thanks again. Thank you for bearing with us during our technical difficulties. I'd like to introduce our staff once more. You've met Megan Hennis, Visitor Services and Membership Coordinator. Rachel Johnson is also here. She's the museum's Curator of Collections and she'll be monitoring the chat and the Q&A. Bison After Breakfast is a bi-weekly hour-long virtual program exploring all things bison. Our first episode we called, uh, our first episode we talked about the impact of COVID-19 on the bison business and two weeks ago, um, in an episode we called Bison Beyond Yellowstone, we talked about different types of bison herds and how they're managed. You can find both of those recordings on YouTube, our website, and through Facebook. Links to access those programs will also be in the chat. And now I would like to introduce our panelists. Chad Kramer is the owner and operator of Kramer Buffalo Company and bison herd manager at Custer State Park in South Dakota. Chad, if you could turn on your video for us, or maybe I can, can I help you do that? And then um, next we'll have Dick. Dick Gearing is the owner of Black, oh, there's Dick, the owner of Black Kettle um, Buffalo in Mound Ridge, Kansas. He's chairman of the board at the National Bison Association and a member of our board of directors here at the museum. I'm trying to see if our technical difficulties have done anything with Chad. Let's see. It's saying that the host has disabled it. Okay, let's see. Ask to start video. Let's see if we can do that now. Oh, there we here go. we are. There's Chad Kramer, guys. And um, this is our biggest technical glitch we've had, but now we know we can handle it. So <laughs> going on from there. Um, we're really glad to have you guys here with us virtually today. We've called today's presentation um, Bison Babies All About Calves. This is a really seasonally appropriate topic as bison cows or mother cows, I know they're called, everywhere are giving birth to these cinnamon colored little calves. Um, this is called calving season. So I'm going to throw our first question out to Dick. Um, can you tell us why bison have a breeding season versus calving year round? And I'm going to let you both sort of fill in each other's gaps here today because you both bounce off each other. <laughs> sure. Um, and, and Chad will probably have some, some pretty good input from, from the academia standpoint on this, but I assume evolution has caused the breeding season. And and they have a breeding season starting with a rut um, where bulls come together to spar, to fight, to establish dominance and uh, amongst themselves to determine who's going to do the breeding that year. You know, that can go on for days or weeks and uh, it can be quite the display and quite an affair. And, you know, after all that to do, as with most mammals, the females have the final say in the matter. But um, bison don't cycle every six weeks like cattle do, so they don't come into heat every every six weeks, and so it's it's more of a seasonal, more of a seasonal thing. We they will have calves out of that season, they will breed out of that season, but um, for the most part, we'll be getting the majority of the calves in April, May. Yep, and I would add, uh, you know, as as managers, we can change that just looking back at an experience in my own herd over the years where I had some extra hay sitting around and thought uh, well I may as well use that up so it doesn't uh, 
go to waste and I did cause some open cows I had to cycle off season and breed and which led to late season calves and that but in a natural setting especially in the 18 years of being here at Custer Park where we don't supplemental feed uh, the main herd at all anymore we did when I first started but um, they pretty much I kind of gauge at the park here each season by how many calves we have with cinnamon on them um, at roundup time which is late September and it's varied anywhere from three or four in a year up to a couple dozen so and that kind of shows that you know you're not looking at that current season but what the previous season was so if you have varying growing conditions say you start out dry but you get a fall uh, precipitation to like make those cool season grasses really flush late in the fall you may get some young animals or other ones that didn't breed during the normal season that will cycle and breed and it just varies in a natural setting it varies year to year so I mean a good point and then I think that you know a lot of when I say a lot of people I mean I didn't know this five years ago <laughs> So I'm the, a lot of people that I'm, I'm the baseline, right? I knew nothing. So what you're saying here is breeding season is also connected to um, their nutrition. Yes. Okay, so good. And I mean, I know if you're not healthy, I mean, I guess if a bison is unhealthy, that would lead to not being, not getting pregnant. Well, yeah, you're, you're going to find that um, nutrition has a lot to do with all of this, whether, whether we're talking about weight gain, maturing early, you know, uh, or late, all, all those things. And a, and a female is going to take care of her, nu her nutritional needs first. And if yep. she's not getting those met, she's not going to cycle. Great. That's good to know. I mean, just. And that kind of refers back to what Chad said, that, that if she didn't the first round and then he gets that late flush of fall grass, they, that can really kind of throw some some things off because she didn't she didn't get it done the first time. Okay, great. That's really helpful because again, um, I'm hoping that there's other people like me out there who have no knowledge of bison at all. So this is really good to let them know. Um, so let's go to our second question, and this is one I really like because it amazes all of our museum visitors to find these these little facts out. They're amazed to find out how quickly bison calves can uh, stand, walk, um, run. And so when I'm talking to school kids, especially, I always ask them something like, do you guys have little brothers or sisters? You know, like, how long did it take before your, in, in when your brother was born, could he stand up and, you know, how, how long did it take him to stand up? And they're like, oh, you're silly. You know what I mean? But then when I give them some perspective and tell them that, you know, how fast, how quickly calves can do this, um, they're pretty shocked. So can you guys tell us a little bit about what bison calves are able to accomplish in just their first hours of life? Who wants to take well, this, Chad? Go ahead, Dick. <laughs> um, well, all right, standing, you know, standing up and gaining their balance and, and finding that udder for the first time for their first meal is, is critical and it's important. They expend a lot of energy doing that and if they're not successful um if if they if they can't get up and and find that udder to get their first meal fairly quickly um and you know, i'm talking about 15 minutes 10 15 20 minutes something like that is probably pretty typical if wow. they don't do that they they aren't able to get back up they're too weak and if they can't get up they're never going to get that first meal and things aren't going to end well um, so that, you know that's one of the that's probably the most important thing right off the bat. Um, after that, it, it from my observations, they imprint off of mom very very quickly, yes. and what she does and what the herd does and 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 all of that. And um, you know, mom teaches them the the immediate dangers quite readily. And in the first three or four days, it's not uncommon to find those cows taking those calves off to the far corner if you show up. Whereas, you know, the cows that have had calves on the ground for a week or, or better don't seem to pay any attention um, unless you're exhibiting, uh, you know, some kind of threatening behavior. But 
they give a lot of repetitive lessons and those calves learn quickly. So they're basically just little copycats. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. I'd add to, uh, you know, right when that calf is first born, um, they may have some of the, the placenta covering them that, and you'll see cow, um, especially cows that have calved several times, but sometimes, you know, the first calvers, it's, it's new to that cow also, so it takes her a little bit, but the instinct will kick in. The, the, the cow will start licking that calf and cleaning it up, and that helps to stimulate the blood flow and get that calf moving. And then you'll see, you know, she'll lick it. And actually for the size of them, sometimes it appears pretty rough that she's licking it, but she's cleaning it off. Um, and that helps to stimulate that circulation and initiate it to attempt to get up. And, and like Dick said, I mean, I think over the years, the ones I've caught calving, you know, 10 to 15 minutes, the earliest, probably out to 30 minutes, but they'll, they'll attempt to stand usually within 10 minutes. They'll try and they might fall back down, but they'll rest for a minute or two and then attempt it again. And they finally get up and do the wobble and, and figure that balance out. And, and then shortly after that, um, they'll go to attempt to find nursing and the cow usually will kind of nuzzle them and, and help them get that accomplished too. So. It's really, I mean, it's sometimes on Facebook, you can see videos and I think it is really, it's really sweet, but, and then they're, tell, tell us about walking and running. So they hobble up, they get some milk and then how fast are they usually walking and then maybe running around? Oh, I would say, you know, within half hour, 45 minutes, they're walking. I've seen some as soon as 20 minutes. Um, if the cow doesn't, especially experienced cows, they usually want to be, just be left alone. They don't even, I mean, I've had some okay, cows kids, over the years. Yeah, they, they even see you coming in a pickup and they're heading the other direction and they'll do everything they can to get that calf come with them. But um, 10 to 15 minutes, the earliest, they're wobbly walking along behind. And sometimes, you know, shortly after that, they, they'll be running along with mom. So that's awesome. And they're about 40 pounds when they're born, right? Or am I right? 40, 30? Yeah, 40 to 50, I would say, is average. Okay, great. So so that'll lead to the next question. So we talked about them getting up, they're born, they're 50 pounds, 40, 50 pounds. Then can you guys talk about how fast the animals continue to grow? So basically, like, what happens in their first year of life? Like, what are the changes that we see in the calves? Um, I, I'll take that first, I guess. Um, but about, you know, as you said, they're born cinnamon. They're, they're, they're born a completely different color. And I think it's along around three months to four months, they start changing colors. And, yep. uh, you know, the bulls are, are born with little buttons for horns and you can barely see the heifer calves when they're, when they're born, but they have them. Um, what's interesting is we were talking earlier about the, the lessons that, that mom and the herd teaches even though they don't have anything up there per se, um, they already know how to use them. And when, when you get a bottle baby, you find out they know exactly how to use them. <laughs> so um, quickly, I'm gonna interject really quick, Dick, because you're gonna, I have this question as a later question, but I hear you already saying bulls and heifers. So I wanna talk, I wanna just mention quickly for the people who were like me and had no idea what these people were talking about when they were saying bulls and heifers. So bulls, boy, heifer is the female. And um, yeah, yep. sorry. I just, you know, just in case everyone I'm sure knew more than me, but if they didn't. <laughs> well, they, and, and they continue to, you know, to grow and develop, they play and mimic, you know, the herd behavior all the time, all of, all of the herd behavior. And by fall, you know, depending on nutrition available, we're probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 450 pounds. And then, of course, where the nutrition's even better, uh, they could be as heavy as 550 pounds. So um, a couple, how many months? Three, four, five? It's by, no, that would be by six or seven to six nine. Six or seven months? Yep. It depends on. Um, and then, you know, most most producers will be weaning in the fall and place them in a different location or a different setting for, for their next journey. 
um, you know, and others leave the calves with the mom and let her, let her uh, uh, wean them herself. And, you know, we think that's a cold snap followed by the dormancy that they experience in the, in the winter months that the adults uh, experience that triggers, you know, that for mom to go ahead and wean that calf, even though the calf would remain with her uh, for protection and, and for quite a time. But Chad, you got stuff to add to that? No, I agree with everything you said there, Dick. Like I said, usually four to 500 pounds at six months age in that range, just depending on a producer's breeding program. So, you know. yeah. And I also just want to, you know, on your question, you had, you had said something about, you know, for that year growing to adulthood. Well, these, these guys are a year late, a year behind cattle, if you will. And so, um, you know, that first year, they're still, we consider them calves. And when they get into that one-year-old up to two-year-old, that's when we call them yearlings. And that's, that's a little bit of a difference with the, with the cattle world. But they're, during that time, they're kind of like adolescent and preteen up to, to teenagers. And um, they, they kind of hang with the herd uh, pretty tight up to two years and even up to three years old if they've never you know, been removed. They, they like to hang with that, that stability and that safety. Uh, right. Not, not get into the really mature bulls that are older, say five and, and, and up, that they like to travel off by themselves until the rut comes again. Okay, cool. So there's a couple of things that are in my head um, because we don't have pictures here. We haven't figured out how to how to put images. We're just not that technologically savvy right now. But so one of the things I notice is, and I don't exactly know when it happens, but um, can you guys talk about when the hump develops and when horns start really developing and, and not just being the buttons or like little nubs. But one thing I wanted to tell people that I think is super cool is um, there is this stage that bison calves go through. And I think when they're almost developing their hump and their cinnamon fur, it doesn't like fall off or anything. It's just brown fur seems or black fur seems to start poking out through their noses and eyes. And they're sort of growing and then that black fur is growing in. And they, they look really like, like like little raccoons almost, and I call them teenagers then because they, they often seem really um, not lanky, but still a little clumsy, like they're growing weird. There's that like weird phase. And then is that accurate? I mean, that's just what I see from ours, so. Go ahead, Chad. Yeah, I mean, that, <laughs> it's kind of like you said, when they're transitioning and that color you could almost say it was like molting, but um, it will just kind of gradually turn to the brownish color. And like you said, muzzle and around the eyes first, um, usually is what happens. And then uh, one other thing I noticed like uh, over the years is off season calves. So like fall calves um, going through the winter time they tend to hold that cinnamon color much, much longer. Oh. Like we've had a few here this, this winter in the park. I mean, they're six to seven months old now and they still have that cinnamon on them. So it's, I think in a normal uh, cycle, they transition, like Dick said, at that two to start that two to three months age. Um, if they're off season, and I think it's because of the weather um, they will hold that a lot longer before they transition to that brown, brown coloring. But, and as far as the horns, um, you know, there's the bulls, of course, have more horn growth. There's more mass there to them. Mm -hmm. So it just transitions, um, you know, and talking with folks here at the park over the years, your yearling year on, on bulls, the horns are just going out. And then I call their two-year-old years what I call when they go to their field goal. So they'll turn up and pretty much yeah, go straight that's up. Yeah, that's what is. That's a good For the most part. So, you know, I, that's what I tell people. That's kind of when their horns are like field goal posts. Um, and then as they age past that, they may, depending on genetics, they may start curving in a little bit more. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in general, like you said, with the horns, bulls are – twice the mass at the base of the horn than cows. Um, and then the cows tend to curl much, much more than the bulls. So, 
That's yeah. And then the hump, is that the, at three months? When does the, like a hump start to form? Or is that earlier? I don't. Dick, you're muted. It's, you know, the hump is there if you look at them when they're real young. Not pronounced. Confirmation, but it's just not as pro pronounced. The older yeah. that they get, that keeps growing. Okay. Um, you know, on big mature bulls, that longest hump bone or spinous process at the center line of the shoulder, they're, they're 24 to 26 inches long on the ones I've measured. So, you know, at, at birth, I would have to guess they're maybe two or three inches, but just as they grow, that, that skeletal just keeps expanding and expanding on them. So, cool. but cool. it's kind of there, you know, if you, if you'd be able to compare a bison calf to a beef calf side by side early, I think see. you'd be able to see that difference quite a bit. Awesome. Dick, yeah. What you yeah, you also, I mean, you asked at what point, Alana, you asked at what point do they develop that? Well, I, I think Chad hit the nail on the head. It's there and it's, you can see it at birth. It's very subtle. But yeah. all of those things are an everyday, there's an everyday progression to it. It's just right. slow. And, you know, it's kind of like shedding season. Um, and as opposed to, to getting ready for winter. Yes, I, we I, want answers. You can't say at four months. <laughs> but, you know, but, I, but what I think I can say is the process of shedding starts the day, the days start getting shorter. And I think yeah. the process starts the day that the days start getting longer or the other way around, what, whatever I meant. Not what I said, but that <laughs> takes a while till you see the shedding and it takes a while till you see the, the hair growth, but it started back, back a ways. Yeah, so that's, I mean, that's good to note. It's yeah. a process. I mean, this is a natural process, always evolving. So we say maybe you can see it at this point in time the best, but it's all, always been happening. Yep. And a, a lot of those, like Dick mentioned, a lot, a lot of what happens is related to day length. Oh. Throughout the season. And I believe in, even with the rut, you know, the rut will vary time frame here at the park. Um, what I've seen our rut and it's a long established herd. Um, our rut will start around the 4th of July. We'll have a little bit of pre-rut, but the peak of the rut, typically is the last week of July, first week of August. Um, you know, in my personal herd, I literally am right across the fence and not as long established herd in the last 10 to 12 years, but my calves on average come a little bit later than what the park calves do. Mm -hmm. And as time went on, I would anticipate that would probably transition to being closer to what the park is but it's just because I've brought animals from different sources and different areas of the, the country together. And, and so them mission and figuring everything out, it's, it's different, even Got though it. it's within a mile. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So um, we are just we're getting down here. So one thing uh, we haven't talked about yet, which I think we kind of implied is, um, how many offspring does one bison have? And I think people aren't probably super surprised to find out that it's one. But in really rare instances, a bison will give birth to multiples. So I'm wondering, we talked about how nature sort of informs all of these biological processes, but I'm wondering if you guys can talk about how, how, why, whatever you wanna say about how nature intends for bison to only have one calf, what that means. Um, I guess my experience over the last almost 30 years with it, I mean, there's been several sets of twins that I've seen, uh, a number of those, especially like here at the park, since we don't have animals ear tagged, it's hard to keep track of them as the season progresses. Um, just knowing some other producers that have had twins over the years. Uh, my brother in Minnesota has had a couple of sets. Um, 
the cow has supported both of them in one case and another case she won't claim them both i think i also think sometimes twins is genetic because i have visited or know of producers that have had multiple sets of twins out of one a particular cow um so i think there is some and then also i think some of it can be related to nutrition right so super nutrition dick you want to say something about that yeah that that was that was kind of where i was going to head i, I agree with everything chad said but i think nutrition plays a, a huge role in it and um you know the further north you get the better the the grass is typically and and it, it seems like you see a little bit more of that in in, in colder climates than you do down here, you know, in the central states or, or even south. And at the end right. of the day, that kind of e equals out to longevity as well of, of that scenario. It's pretty tough for cows down here to be able to, to milk enough for Produce cows. enough, right, right. It's pretty hard. It, it, it sounds really cool and fun, but it isn't always the greatest scenario in the, in the world. Um, well, right. I mean, and we had twins a couple of years ago, I think two, two years ago now, we had a set of twins and one of them was, was not accepted by the mom. And that twin was really, really weak and almost died and, and had to have human intervention. So one of the things I guess I would like you guys to talk about are the different scenarios. And just for everyone to realize, um, like Chad works at a state park, um, they do different, they have a different operations, a different management than let's say the national park system. So if twins were born in the national park system and the mother decided to only accept, she only had enough milk for one of them, the other one would just be left there, right? And so that's one of the scenarios. And I guess I'll let you guys talk about what are the other ones. Chad, you sort of mentioned they could accept both of them. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say from a public heard standpoint here with the state um if i need and as a public herd manager here if i need to intervene i will mm -hmm. um i usually try to give a benefit of the doubt um that she's supporting them but i'll try to keep a close eye on it and we have had one instance over the years where we had a twin we actually had a visitor that observed the cow cabin and having both of them and sat there for quite some time watching. And the cow, um, they said the cow did clean both of them up, claimed them both. Uh, they both nursed initially. Uh, one was smaller than the other, more of a, a runt type situation. They said quite a bit smaller than the other calf. Um, and then after a time period, I think a half hour to an hour, maybe even a little more, the main herd started grazing away and at that point, the cow started following, kind of going off with the herd. And at that point, she started kicking the smaller calf off. Um, and the gal said that the calf then went around trying to go to other cows and nurse or stay with them. And of course, um, with bison, they pretty much just claim their calf for the most part. Okay. Um, they were they were pushing that calf away also. And, and the gal, I remember her email, it's been years ago. She, she had emailed a few days later after she got back home to Colorado. And she said, I just, I understand nature in that, but I need to know for myself, you know, is there, will this calf survive? Cause she Aww. said it just sat down in the grass and, and looked lonely sitting out there. And, and of course, um, I said, no, at that age, they need to nurse to support them. Yeah. Um, but then this was uh, three, I guess, three days after she had seen that. The calf was actually born on Memorial Day. Mm -hmm. And uh, the day before I received her email, one of our staff, or another visitor had seen this calf laying up on a hill in that area and one of our other staff came by and stopped and visit with them and walked up there and as, as soon as the calf seen him it came running over to him and of course his first comment to me was i was wondering where mom was looking in the trees and the calf followed him down to the vehicle and he called me and 
I said, just bring it to my house and I've got supplies to feed it and such. So, so we did raise that one. Um, and he was small. He was a runt. Even as he matured, he was behind what would be normal. Um, yeah. But in that situation there, I mean, that calf wouldn't have survived if he had just been left on and because she decided to, to claim one and not the other. Right. And as you say, I mean, I think I've heard like a rare, in rare, rare, rare instances, maybe there's already a cow out there who had lost a baby or something and took it, but I don't know. I mean, I have no, that's anecdotal and I have no idea that that has ever occurred, not in, you know, but um, the other, I guess the, the options that we're talking about now is, so there's no cow, you're not in a state park, you're not, you know, if you were in Yellowstone, I remember that one incident that we've all probably remember where the visitors kindly tried to put this wet calf into their SUV to dry off. So, um, yeah, I mean, and I feel like I skipped a question here, but we talked about, oh no, it's coming. We talked about how if you have, um, if you have early or late calves, I mean, there's a possibility of one being born under extreme weather. So please, people don't do that because if they were left wet alone there, one of two things are going to happen. Like, right, nature's going to take its course or the mom's going to come. Right? I mean, bad things can happen when you try and intervene there. Um, but what I know that you, you and your family do, and I know others do, and we did here at the museum once, is you take one of those little um, twin babies or any bison baby that we call orphan and you raise them as a bottle baby. And I guess that's the most common, would that be the most common you think outcome if there's twins born in a ranching situation? Yeah, they can, a lot of producers are, are you know, obviously everything needs to be sustainable and, and, and make sense and we also, aside from the money part of it, you feel a responsibility to make sure that everybody's got a chance and, mm -hmm. and you, you're in control of these animals. And so you need to do the best you can. Um, one of the tough parts of that is um, getting them. And once they've imprinted off of mom, getting them to, to come to you, if, if they come to you, you know, great. You, it, you just, life just got easier. But when, <laughs> When they don't, then it's a real battle, and and it's the gift that keeps on giving. Uh, or not? I've been I, I tried a fifty pound calf can really feel like one hundred and fifty or two hundred pounds running at you, huh? Yeah, they can <laughs> develop a wallop. There is no doubt about it. Um, they know what those horns are for, even though there's not much there. Um, you know, one thing to to consider and remember is as you as you continue through that process and that calf gets more and more comfortable with you. Um, probably most of us have made that mistake of, of making a, a quote unquote pet out of it. And it's been real fun, real cool that, right. that this wild animal will come up to you. But in the end, as they get bigger, even if they're not intending to, uh, to hurt you, they're going to do what Buffalo do. And when they're weighing a thousand pounds, um, just the, the the friendly nudge could be enough to take you out and they don't make good pets they're not they're not uh that, that's not what nature intended them to be and i i don't think you ever really take the wild out of them you can they can right. get very used to you and very comfortable but um kind of a kind of a tough scenario kind of complex right. so i mean in terms of bottle raising animals i think i'm going to make a generalization, but the goal will be to not have a pet, but to attempt to integrate that animal back into the herd. Sure. It should be, yep. Right. And so, I mean, that is like to give them the life that's best for them, not for us. <laughs> so, right. Which seems cool until we get knocked over. Um, so, let's see. We One thing I want to Yeah, I sure. Just, uh, I guess expound on that would be, I mean, there's, there's studies done out there as far as males. Um, and it doesn't matter orphans, what species it is, but right. if you have male, a male calf imprint on you, 
Um, and I've seen this personally on some local folks here that raised a calf. Um, the one we did and we kept quite a while, we did end up castrating him because we took that that natural drive away from him. Oh. Um, we didn't see it on him. This other one, which was a couple years older, the folks did not. And that bull at five to six years of age, he would kill somebody. He didn't, he wouldn't, he wasn't going to do it in an aggressive manner, but because he had imprinted to people, people were his herd, even though they put him back out with the bison herd at two to three years of age. Anytime he saw a person, he came running for that person because people were his herd. Um, yeah. And right. he was very aggressive. You would, there is no way that I would have been caught on foot without a way to protect myself out there. And in fact, he, he took it out on, on the folks' vehicles wow. um, as he matured and they kept him till he was 10 to 12 years old or so before he passed naturally. Um, but very, it was a very dangerous situation and it never yeah. should have, in my opinion, it never should have got as far as it did. Right. Um, particularly with males, cows, the fe females I've seen over the years, you transition them back to the herd breeding herd. They, in my opinion, transition much easier back to doing what they're supposed to do. They'll still be friendly, but you know, in 30 years of working with these animals, I tell people, you know, you, you can habituate them but you'll never get that wildness out of them. There's very, right. very few instances that I know of producers that have bottle raised calves, in particular males, that have kept them very, very, quote, tame, where they can go out and pet them and lead them around and stuff. But even in that scenario, you can go back through history. I remember when I got interested in bison 30 years ago, um, through a speech in college, um, doing research for that back in the late 1800s, there was instances of people that raised bottle calves and ultimately it killed them. Right. So right. you don't ever let your guard down on it. It's mm -mm. particularly when they get past that yearling age, um, you need to be on your toes and watching. Well, that's the big thing, right? They're not domesticated. They're right. still wild, and that is the point. That's a big point. Um, so I guess I'm, I'm trying to figure, some of this we sort of skimmed through already, but there's one thing that I want to talk about. It seems like we'll be talking a lot about orphan calves, and I don't want to, because it is so rare or late weaning calves, I just, I feel like people will find this interesting. So um, one of the things that we talked about is, when calves are ready to be weaned, typically there'll be a group, but in the group, and I was at the 777 ranch uh, last year for the roundup and I was able to see you and your family come. I remember there was a pen full of the calves that were ready to be weaned. And in that group of, I don't know, there were hundreds. Does 400 seem right? I don't, I don't know. But um, there were like four or five cinnamon calves. So those were not ready to be weaned yet. And so you came and I remember it was just you and Cody and you were able to very quietly, so quietly, um, separate those animals and get get the little ones um, ready to go back to your ranch where you guys bottle fed them and I guess integrated them into your herd. Is that correct? So can yeah. you can you sort of explain to people because to me I thought you you guys were like the bison whisperers. Explain like what you know, how you know about how bison instinctually behave. And how even in those in those groups like that, because what I saw was like this swirling method, like the bison would all swirl together and run this way, and you guys just sort of knew how to stand to get them to go. So can you talk about that? Because I think that's super interesting. Well, it's you know the big thing is is just experience, and in the last several years here now, with the age of my kids helping and stuff, I've had to realize I need to explain myself. And even at the park here with staff, when we're working animals, um, I've had uh, one gal on staff for several years in particular, she's like, how do you know that? 
how do you know that's what he's thinking? And I, anymore, it's just instinct to me. I'm reading, you know, I got to stop and think about what I'm actually doing to mm-hmm. explain it to somebody, but it's just right. experience and instinct, but it's, it's reading their body language and then knowing their behavior too, like a herd behavior, yeah. how they like to stay together. And, and there's a lot, you know, you can, uh, there's a lot of stockmanship classes and books out there that you can take and it's using those basic principles uh bison some things are a little bit different with bison than than other like beef and that um but it's those basic principles but a lot of it is just reading their body language you know i tell people if you if you watch them you know what you watch their ears just like with horses their ears will tell you a lot who they're who they're listening where they're you know they'll and they can turn an ear separately. So they may have an ear over here because something's getting their attention there and they got an ear facing the other way because there's two things going on and they're trying to decide, you know, is one of these more of a threat than the other or not? What's Or, or they're just curiosity. So the big thing is just the experience and learning that body language on them and then applying that pressure where it needs to be. But um, I don't remember exactly that day um, That's okay. talking about Alana, but, but it's, you know, I can imagine if it's in a group like that, you're trying to sort or at least narrow down the number you did. in the group, you just, you just keep working, keeping track of that herd dynamic. Yeah. And when you, when the opportunity comes, you know, you, you're putting pressure on to try and say, cut the back end off. And when you say put pressure on, what you mean is you kind of walk toward? Yep. You kind of yep. put your body language moving towards the animals, and then you would see some of them break away into a different pen, and we would sort of close the the yep. on that pen. And then could you just talk about, because I think people really don't know this, is like the little ones, I mean, didn't they tend to stay in the middle of the group trying to hide, or were they just anywhere, or, you know, typically? You know, lots of, lots of times bison have a very um, established dominance Mm -hmm. schedule. And of course, size can play into that quite a bit. So um, older calves versus those younger ones definitely will play just the size factor on it. And you will see lots of times your smaller smaller ones grouped together versus the the large ones. So it's just trying to take advantage of if that situation happens and step in and and you're right in pressure pressure can be as subtle sometimes it's as subtle as even looking right um and other times you can just lean in towards them is enough pressure and that may be enough for one animal and not for another one it because may they take want to go away from it you. may take several steps to move another one but mm-hmm. you may have one where you can just lean towards it and get it to move. So, you know, I tell people they're, they're individuals, just Spectrum. like each of us. Just got you know, like each dogs. of us has our own mm-hmm. fine personal space we're okay with. Mm-hmm. You meet people that their personal space is right here. They're okay with that. And then you have others where, you know, it's several feet away. So awesome. um, it's, but it boils down to just experience and recognizing that behavior and don't and do this at home. <laughs> yeah. If you find yourself at home near a pen of 400 or so bison calves, don't do anything. <laughs> Call Chad. <laughs> Dick, do you want to say anything about about? Yeah, I Go think ahead. he hit. I think he hit um, most of the most of the points right on right on topic. It, it's it's learning the body language, learning their their habits, their idiosyncrasies, and what moves them, what makes them work. And, you know, most people that have trouble doing that um, is they're moving too fast, moving too far. They're moving in a threatening manner. And when you learn right. and you learn how to just kind of take it easy and let things happen and take your opportunities, like he mentioned, you know, let them separate themselves a little bit and be smart enough to rather than force it, take that opportunity. Um, w- one of the biggest things is, is simply um, hands down, mouth shut, just small presence will, will carry the day. Cause if you come in there with your arms bowed and 
waving your hands, it's not going to go well. You are a total threat, and they're they're going to be concerned about you as opposed to looking for an out. They're going to be looking for, you know, what are you going to do type thing. Yes, yeah, that's what I'm trying to say about working with their what you know about their behavior because I mean we're not bigger than them, yeah. so <laughs> we're not going to go in and. <laughs> The other thing is is taking taking it in bites, and I think Chad kind of alluded to that and mentioned that it, it, you take it down in in stair steps. Um, that it, it's kind of like eating an elephant, <laughs> one bite at a time. You're not going to get her all done the, on one fell swoop. So, mm -hmm. I was going to say too, Ed, that the the old saying you can you can force a bison to go anywhere it wants to go. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Or what's the fence that keeps the bison? If there's no fence that will keep a bison out, what is it? I don't know. I've heard it all the yeah. time. It's but, always um, one thing with experience, like Dick said too, is it's realizing the opportunity to take advantage of, you know, making them think that it's their idea or realizing that moment when you take the opportunity that's at hand in front of you instead of trying to force it. Mm -hmm. Work with them, work with their behaviors and and learn that and you know I've told people uh, some days as far as like doing roundup um, or working animals weather can definitely change things uh, you know weather fronts coming through and stuff sometimes you got to go into it where if it's not working today there's always tomorrow and that is tough as a manager and a producer to do that because Lots of times you have a veterinarian scheduled or, right. you know, whatever it is, but um, realizing that sometimes in the best interest of health for the animal, for yourself, and also you can even put it down to the economics of it as far as the influence of stress. Um, right. Sometimes you just need to take a step back and say, it ain't working today we'll try it tomorrow right so that's flexibility that's needed i mean the the thing that i think we'll talk about this probably in a future session in in talking about working the animals is the stress level and how it's really important to um try low stress handling practices and things like that rather than just trying to say we have to get it done today it's got to be done today you have to work with their natural um way right and what i'd throw in too i mean we're kind of a little bit getting off topic mm -hmm. from the cabin but you can actually start you know from the very beginning during cabin season just having a presence being out there letting those new calves get used to people on foot uh, vehicles ATVs, horses, whatever your method is, mm -hmm. even even uh, acclimating them or habituating them to having dogs. If you're using dogs, I've used dogs right. for working them and, and gathering them over the years. So um, you can start that right away because like Dick mentioned earlier, um, they start learning from mom. I mean, they start watching mom from day one and they learn what to eat, where to go, um, you know, all, all of that from watching her. Mm -hmm. So, okay, mom is probably a pretty good place to end-ish almost, but Chad, every year we talked about those incidents in parks where visitors do something really unsafe. And, and maybe Dick, you've seen this with people doing things really unsafe too. Um, we talked about the SUV thing. Is there anything you would like people here to know um, what would you like the public to know? Because there's going to be people who are watching this about um, what do you want them to know or think about when they see bison calves in the park in a park setting? Like, give them some, give them some advice. <laughs> you know, just the biggest thing, and it's exactly what happened in Yellowstone and has happened in other parks or public places that that people can drive through and, and it happens with all wildlife. I mean, mm -hmm. as a department, we put out annually every spring when babies are coming that we try to put out in the media, you know, don't pick up the fawns and same thing with the bison calves. They'll, you know, those cows will quote plant that calf and graze off with the herd. Sometimes 
you know, I've told people up to half mile, maybe even a mile, depending on, on the terrain, that cow, but she knows the general area that that calf was last left. Mm -hmm. Um, and they will typically come back occasionally you get a situation where the calf may actually have gotten left behind. Um, mm -hmm. but percentage wise, that's a low percentage in my opinion. Um, yeah. there are difficulties, particularly with first calvers. Um, right. that's lots of times the orphans we've, I've had over the years are from first calvers where that herd instinct is stronger than the mother in instinct. Yeah. So if that calf typically, um, I've found is there's a reason that calf is weak, whether it was a little premature or structurally, um, sometimes structurally they have issues with leg joints, mm -hmm. um, things like that, that they just have trouble getting up there to to uh, nurse and that but if they don't keep up with that cow or that that first calving cow um they'll they'll eventually get left behind mm. yeah. so that's been my experience but i tell people visitors you know if you see a calf you can let staff know a location um but try to just leave it where it's at you know? yeah the lone calf Right. Yep. And then if they're yep. with their mom, she's probably pretty protective. <laughs> yes. And we have, we have had the situation years ago where we had visitors found a calf nearby the wildlife loop, no other bison around. They picked it up, put it in their van, brought it to the visitor center on course on a weekend, they called me and I said, just take it back where you found oh, it. No, no, no. Um, mom should come back and we'll, we'll check up on it and oh goodness and we did but but yeah um gosh and then it's just education this time of year I mean the most protective time of year is that cow with the calf and then yeah. I tell people the other other time to really watch is during the rut during the breeding right. season when when bulls are tending yes so um I have run us right to the end of this hour. I'm sorry. So we're, we're, we're over the hour, but I want to give you guys time for final thoughts. Dick, do you have anything that we have left out that you want to say? Oh, there's, there's a lot to say, but in, so in, reference, to we'll say last, <laughs> in, in reference to the last question, um, you know, that's very applicable for the, for the parks, but guess what? It's also applicable for the private producers because Great. we, we grew up, most of us grew up working with cattle at some point in the venture and you know we just want to do we want to help we want to do whatever we can to make sure things are good and this animal will teach you to walk away and to, to <laughs> leave them alone because chances are you're going to screw things up more by trying to help than than you are and there's there's exceptions to every rule um right but uh you know, God made this animal pretty self-sufficient, and yep. every time we try to improve on it, we find out we're stubbing our toe, so yeah. let it be. Yeah, and that's part of the awesome thing about bison, I think, is they, they got it under control. <laughs> you bet. You bet. So, uh, Chad, do you have any final thoughts? Um, no, I think we covered a lot. Yeah, good. For the time, All right. So. Perfect. Well, thank you both so much. This has been a great conversation. Um, I learned some stuff. Clearly, there were things I didn't know, but um, we really, really appreciate you guys sharing your knowledge with us and um, the people that are here. Um, to our viewers, we appreciate you joining us, and we appreciate your interest in the topic. Um, again, we know times are tough for people right now, but if you could um, and you would like to place a donation of any size, you can do so to support the museum. Um, you can shop in our store. Links are in the chat. Um, all the purchases in the store support the museum. If you want to keep up with what we're doing at the museum, you can do so um, through social media. You can um, add yourself uh, on our mailing list from our website. Let's see. Yep, we have an uh, email list on our website. And then this event is bi-weekly, and our next discussion is going to be June 4th, same time. We're going to call this one Bison Basics and introduce, 
an introduction to vice and behavior and relationships. So a lot of what we started talking about today. Dick, you have something to say? Yeah, um, I know the, the chat streaming across the bottom. If, the, if people didn't get their questions answered, I'm, I'm sure Chad wouldn't mind and I know I won't get contact us and yep. we'll answer your questions. Absolutely, Rachel will facilitate that too. So we're gonna, we're going to, um, post, I think, a resource guide at the end, and we'll connect you all. So we really appreciate that. Um, if there are other topics you guys want to see covered, questions you would like answered, or would like to be a panelist or have a suggestion for a panelist in a future event, shoot us an email, collections at buffalomuseum.com. You can send us a Facebook message or give us a call, 701-252-8648. Thank you again, and we hope to see you guys all next time. Thank you, thank you guys. I love hearing all of your experience. It's like a wealth of information every single time. Thank you, okay. it was a pleasure.